Okay, guys, so this is the class for week nine on Frederick Wiseman's Welfare, which is a documentary released in 1975. Um, it's nearly three hours long, as you'll have noticed if you watched it, and it consists entirely of a variety of different scenes and interviews which took place in a welfare office in New York which is a place where people would have gone to receive a social security payments, as you see if you watch the film. Um, it's one of quite a lot of documentaries made by Wiseman, which focus on kind of American institutions. So public offices or public buildings or public institutions which in some way mediate social life in America or which have a large impact on social life in America. Wiseman's other documentaries include one about the New York Public Library and one about a mental hospital, uh, one about public housing. Um, there's a lot of them, but welfare is the one that I, that I chose to look at for this week. Um, and as we say here, it doesn't welfare doesn't have a voiceover it doesn't have really a it doesn't really have an argument to it so it's not trying to inform the reader uh, inform the viewer sorry um about things it's not trying to make them have a certain kind of point of view um but it is attempting in some way to show life so it's what we might call um, direct cinema is sometimes what it's known as when we talk about kind of documentary filmmaking, which rather than having an overarching argument, which it wants to tell the reader about, tell the viewer about, um, is more concerned with kind of presenting the texture and presenting a kind of um, kind of slices of life as they take place within the the area that the filmmaker has chosen to film, which in this case is um, the one welfare office in New York. And yeah, as I say here, we kind of see this tapestry of different lives as people pass through the welfare office attempting to achieve some degree of income support. And as the staff of the building themselves kind of mediate between people's demands and people's needs um, and the rules which govern the institution and which dictate who they can and cannot give support to. So one concept that I want to introduce quite early on in relation to welfare, which also ties into things we've talked about previously on the course and will tie into things we, we talk about again, um, is the idea of the reserve army. Um, so we've talked about the lumpen and the surplus population. Um, and what the reserve army are is kind of one step above the lumpen. And these are people who... Um, fall within the kind of remit of the working class, but who aren't always working and who kind of function in this way, which means that they're quite vulnerable to the fluctuations of an economy. So someone who is in a reserve army may be out of work at the moment, um, but in situations of a boom time, in situations in which there's a lot of industry or a lot of production, um, they might be called back in to the, um, to the workforce. So... One argument for the kind of development of welfare as it persisted throughout the late 19th and early 20th century in Europe and the US was the kind of need to maintain something like a reserve army of labor. You needed workers who were able to work when called upon, but the nature of a capitalist economy is such that all people can't be working all the time and that work will fluctuate quite significantly depending on what different industries are doing at different points in time. Um, so yeah, one of the arguments for the welfare state and for the reason why it was developed, one of them, not at all, not this is not a, the only reason, but one of the main reasons is the kind of maintenance of this reserve army. So keeping people out of work, keeping them healthy, keeping them within a certain set of behaviours and moral behaviours specifically, which we'll talk about in a minute, which would enable them to go back to work at the point at which they were called upon. One argument, I don't mention this here, but just to add that one argument for the kind of 
or used to explain the prevalence of austerity now in, in Europe and in the US and the kind of decline of the welfare state is that industry is also in not in every part of the world, but in many parts of the world, especially what we call the West, um, old industrial economies is declining and is shrinking. And as industry shrinks, as jobs become scarcer, more and more people cease to exist as part of a reserve army, people who could conceivably be called upon in order to, um, to work in industry. Um, and more and more people move into the kind of lumpen or the surplus population, people who have no hope of finding work ever, really. Um, the more people move over into that kind of population, the more people or the, the less welfare is a priority because you're not trying to keep people together for anything. Um, you're just trying to make sure that they don't um, become too riotty essentially, but we'll talk about that more in a couple of weeks when we look at some more contemporary depictions of the surplus population. Um, but for now, that's the distinction between the reserve army and the lumpen, and we see this in Welfare, the film. So the opening scene of Welfare, which I think is both very beautiful but also quite dark and sad, shows the kind of diversity of people who constitute this... Um, this reserve army of labor. And yeah, Wiseman opens his film by showing these people having their picture taken. So he shows them as they approach the welfare office and as they begin to be integrated into the system, which will enable them, hopefully for them, uh, to receive some kind of welfare check and some kind of income support. And uh, we can just watch this scene. It's worth watching. It's not very long. Straight away, this is kind of what we see. We see these portraits um, that Wiseman does with his own camera, slightly off angle, so it's not the exact thing that the photographer in the film is seeing, but it's kind of close to it. Notice the diversity of the people. Notice the kind of combination of moods that they're in as well. Some of them appear to be sad, some of them are bored, some of them are frustrated. Um, and the way that he cuts back to the camera, so we see the people's faces and they're all quite different, they're quite diverse, different backgrounds, uh, different classes seemingly as well. Some people look more working class than others. Um, and then we see this camera, this kind of you know cold, dark, black, thing which is taking pictures of them um, and I think in some ways we can think of Metropolis here as well we can think of the kind of long march of the workers in Metropolis and they all look the same and they all have kind of the same clothes on even though they're, they're performing slightly different tasks but they're all just workers and here we have a view of the working class of people who come for income support who are overwhelmingly working class, especially in America, where you need to be really poor to be able to get any income support at all. Um, but in reality, we see that these people are diverse. We see that they have different histories. We see that they're from different backgrounds. Um, but they're all brought together through this kind of shared need um, and their input into a system of welfare which will group them together. We have that only outside shot in the entire film. Um, doesn't really, it's not really an establishing shot. It doesn't locate the film in New York, even though it is a shot of a street in New York. You wouldn't know that unless you um, had done some background research into the film or unless you watched the, we watched the film and you heard people talking about the fact it was in New York. There's nothing visually um, about this shot which makes it necessarily in New York. You just see the outside of the building. You see people queuing to gain entrance. So this is in the morning. The building isn't open yet in this shot. And then again, we have this kind of shot of diverse people. Um, some of them are probably lumpen. Some of them are people who won't be working either because they're too old 
um, because they have health conditions, which means that they can't work, or because they have health conditions, which means that they can't work. But at the same time, some of them um, would be workers who are temporarily out of work, or who consider themselves to be temporarily out of work. And Wiseman kind of creates this kind of visual uh, tapestry throughout the movie of these different people with their different histories, but they're all being um, they're all being bound together. Um, and yet he shows us the unique personalities and histories of people, but he doesn't really, they can't really express any of this in the, um, in the film as it is, because they're only there to receive their kind of welfare checks. So again, they have to, um, be integrated into a system which will pay attention to some parts of their life, um, but not to others. Uh, so yeah, he says that Wiseman, just a point here, which you can see in the interview that I put on eCampus, um, he refers to his films as novels, um, not really as documentaries. So he thinks of them as something which um, explores a kind of human drama and has a kind of very strong human element. It's not just about information in the way that some documentaries might be about. Um, and I think we can see part of this already, and we can see part of what he means by this already in the faces that he shows us um, right at the start of the film. Different kind of expressions, different kind of stories, different kinds of expectations. Um, it's all there. Uh, so yeah, next point, um, which I think is articulated um, at several points in the film, is in relation to morality. So not only is the welfare system intended to maintain a kind of reserve army in a specific state of health, um, which is often not very high, but is essentially just not dead. Um, it's also intended to inculcate and to maintain a certain kind of standard of morality and a certain kind of standard of consistency of personality. To claim welfare, you have to turn up at the right time, you have to be living in the right way, you have to meet your appointments. All of these things are um, skills and traits of a working class that those who um, seek to maintain the working class as the working class um, have an interest in maintaining. And we see this at different points in the movie. We see people being questioned about their lifestyles. At one point early on, we see this kind of young couple who at one point appear to be lying and we're not sure if they're kind of trying to say what the interviewer wants them to hear or not. We're not sure how they're really living, um, but we can see that they're trying to appear as if, uh, um, as if they obey certain kind of moral norms, which means that they will be more likely to um, receive the welfare payments that they need in order to survive. Um, and yeah, and we can see the way that these kind of strict requirements both make claiming welfare very difficult, but they also um, create the kind of, or seek to create the kind of moral behaviors and discipline um, which is necessary, or which would be thought of once as having been necessary for a reserve army to be able to go back to work when it's required, um, or to be able to find work. So welfare is not just about receiving money, it's also about, um, making sure that people behave in a way whereby they're judged to deserve money. And we see this in the second half of the film when one of the staff members, uh, the white lady with the perm, um, starts shouting at the Hispanic guy saying that they don't just give out welfare payments. You know, you have to deserve it. You have to be the right kind of person. Um, and again, as I mentioned before, this is a kind of, this is a distinction um, between the lumpen class and the reserve army and the, the lumpen as they're written about by a variety of people um marx included who kind of coined the term but also other other political economists argue that this is a class who are beyond hope so there's no point in trying to you know get the lumpen to behave properly because they never will um, or at least they never will consistently but the reserve army is something which is, as I said, is slightly above this kind of level. And there is a big interest in trying to get the reserve army to 
kind of keep themselves together, keep themselves functioning so that they don't slide completely down into a kind of lumpen existence and also so that they um, can be called back to work when necessary. Okay, next point. Um, accidents and anonymity. We see in welfare, and I've said this already at the start in relation to the start of the film, but we see it everywhere in the film that it's this kind of hyper-rationalized, hyper-abstract process in which people have to kind of give information about their lives, in which they're treated as kind of statistics, and in which there appears to be um, some kind of logical process which is being worked through, which will determine whether or not um, people receive the kind of help that they're asking for. Um, but at the same time, we also see several situations in which it seems like a kind of accident has happened or in which the process seems completely chaotic. It doesn't really make sense. I um, mean, it seems kind of arbitrary and it looks as if um, the question as to whether or not a person gets their welfare check is actually much more to do with luck than it is to do with um, the kind of logical, rational process which is claiming which the welfare system wants to present itself as being about. Um, and we see this in the section... Here, in which this woman, it's a long section in the actual film itself, but I'm just going to play a clip, um, in which this woman kind of becomes increasingly desperate and she realises that the um, that the office have lost her documents and that she's kind of fallen through the gaps in the system. And her friend says... Time to find her record. We would have more time. Time to find her record. The lookout is late. There's a woman in the group. Everybody, 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 everyb
the role in some way either a part of the reserve army or a part of the lumpen population. Um, and they meet in this kind of context of need. And while they might never speak to each other outside in the city, you kind of get this juxtaposition of, um, of random elements. And we can see this in this scene in which an older man and a younger woman meet and speak. And it's just, you know, we, it's difficult to imagine them having a conversation in any other context. Notice the way that they're kind of describing poverty in a way which makes it very, very real. She's talking about having to skip the trains in order to get to the welfare office in order to um, uh, to try and receive her kind of income support check. So yeah, while people, it's difficult to imagine two people who don't know each other of different ages, possibly different classes, um, finding a kind of solidarity um, so quickly, but this is kind of what, as a kind of compression of the city and of the kind of diversity of the urban environment that we find outside, the welfare office brings these kind of random elements together. Um, and we see this in Wiseman's film. We also see the way in which the city or the way in which the history of the city and the history of urban environments comes together in the welfare office in one of the long scenes in the first section of the film, um, in which you see the kind of old racist man or old-ish, older racist man kind of just rambling at the black security guard. And the white guy is kind of talking about sunset cities, which were cities or towns. They were called sunset towns because if you were black, you needed to get out of there by sunset because they were very dangerous places to be um, at night. Um, and he kind of mimics the, um, the language, some of the language of the black power movement, which would have just to have which would have been a big part of American culture in 1975, but would arguably have been a little bit on the decline. Uh, the height of the Black Panther movement party as a force is around about the early 1970s. Um, but these were serious political organizations and they were making, they were a major force in American kind of street politics and in American political organizing in the late 60s and the early 70s. And we don't see this in directly in Wiseman, but we see its echoes and we see the way that the kind of wider political context um, ripples through um, this kind of institution of the welfare office in the sense that we see this kind of um, possibly quite mentally unstable, quite evidently racist white guy having this kind of conversation or trying to have this kind of conversation with this bored black security guard who needs in some way to um, keep talking to him because he's at work and he's, what he can do is restricted by the fact he's at work. He can't just leave. Um, so you kind of have this, um, you have a kind of racial tension which exacerbates or which echo, which doesn't exacerbate, which echoes um, both the past history of racism in the South of America um, and also kind of contemporary um, discourses and political conversations and actions um, 
in in America at the time that this is being at the time that Welfare was shot and edited. Um, but again, the city is a place where these things kind of bubble up. But in the Welfare Office, they're also a bit distorted. It's not clear. Um, how involved either of these characters is, if they're involved at all. Um, it's not clear how much the, the white guy just wants someone to listen to his racist talking, whether or not he really cares about it is a different question. So you have this thing, it's all mediated by the kind of labor market, by the mechanisms of the labor market. Um, and yeah, while, you know, we clearly sympathize with the God and we kind of, you know, want the white guy to shut up, um, at the same time, we also see the kind of pathos of this person who in some way, as much as his views are stupid and wrong, um, is kind of lost in a history that he doesn't quite understand. And we're reminded of the way that we're reminded of the history of America as a country. And we see this kind of history echoing and bubbling up again through this guy's kind of rambles um, and through his directionless talking as he goes on and on. Um, and again, I think in some ways we can compare this to what we've said about the city itself as containing these kind of um, reservoirs and these pockets of historical memory. Um, previously, we talked about that in Blade Runner, Rosemary's Baby and Double Indemnity in terms of kind of architecture, in terms of the way that houses are built. Um, but here we can almost see it in people themselves, the kind of different periods that people have lived through in different places and different classes. And um, the welfare office, because of the diversity of the reserve army, is somewhere which brings these elements together in um, perhaps unexpected and um in ways that they wouldn't be brought together in any other kind of situation. Um, okay, and the final scene of um, Welfare, which I think is brilliant, is just features this guy who is kind of turned down. He's told that he won't receive any income support. And he. it seems clear that the guy who he's talking to knows who he is or that he's seen him before. Um, and he kind of gives this monologue um, to God, essentially. He refers to the Lord um, when he's talking. And we'll watch it here. 15 years by 1988, will be. And kind of gives this monologue about the kind of what he considers to be the state of America. So he kind of says that America is in decline. States of America, there will be nobody here worth saving. Everybody who is worth saving will be someplace else, and I'll be the first to leave. Because for 40 years and seven months I've tried. God knows I've tried to help. Now I can't even help myself, let alone anybody else. How can you help anybody on 11 cents? Five days. Notice the slight reveal here and how it works. I think this is really masterful. And suffer. And suffer for everybody else who's gone before. Our face. We move from this kind of very tragic um, kind of piece of philosophizing, piece of kind of um, quite eloquent statement of desperation. Um, in terms of the state of America, whatever that means, um, to this kind of speech about, in, in which the guy who's talking kind of places himself within the history of the Jewish people, um, this idea of wandering in the metaphorical desert, um, a people without a homeland, and his experience of the welfare state um, perpetuates this feeling, makes him feel like he's living through the same kind of experiences which you would read about in the Bible when the people of, um, when the Israelites are left to wander in the desert for 40 years and they have no 
Um, they're told by God that one day they will reach the kind of promised land, but this kind of metaphor of a wandering people, of a wandering, um, of a people without a homeland defines um, uh, for a lot of Jewish people, especially Jewish people who um, remained in America in the 20th century, um, defines a certain aspect of their experience and a certain aspect of their self-image. And again, I know I keep saying this, but it is a situation in which these kind of old mythologies, thousands of years old, um, regarding what it means to be human, what it is to be kind of um, lost in some way, re-emerge in this kind of really modern experience of bureaucracy. And this guy kind of gives this um, give this speech, which at the same time as Wiseman really focusing on, he also kind of accentuates a slight ridiculousness in it with the kind of... Um, with uh, this woman here and her kind of the way that she looks at him and the way that she um, kind of pulls a face as if to say, oh God, you know, he's being so serious. Um, but also this is potentially a portrait of someone, a real portrait of someone who's really on the edge and who's been driven to the edge by um, the failure of something to meet his own needs, whether that's the welfare office, whether that's his own um, character, or whether it's a combination of the two. So again, we have this kind of tragic, existential, but also funny, I think, um, tone at the end of the film, which really grounds the experience of the welfare office as being one which we can think about in terms of um, a much broader search for meaning and search for um, home, whatever that might mean. Um, in the modern world, but also throughout history in general. Okay, guys, so tasks for this week. Um, choose one cut or one edit. I mean, I just highlighted one of my favorite ones in the film, but there are lots of others, actually. There isn't a huge amount of variety, um, but there's some really masterful camera work in welfare. And... Wiseman has an ability to change the tone of a scene or change the focus of a scene very quickly using quite subtle cutaways from someone who's talking or by showing a different part of their body. Um, so choose one of those and I would like you to write a paragraph about the effect that this kind of cutaway has. It could be at any point in the film. Um, and yeah, write that into a paragraph and send it to me if you'd like to. I would actually really love to read them. Um, but as you know, the assessment for this course is in the final couple of weeks. So if you don't want to send me the writing, you don't have to. Um, and yeah, questions for the catch up session are Wiseman says he wants to show people how they really are and not twist things, not kind of create a, create a kind of false narrative or a false sense um, of what's going on in his movies. Um, but do you think that the film Welfare succeeds in doing this? Um, is it even possible is a question for um, documentary makers. Um, is it desirable even? Um, but yeah, can you think of moments in the film in which people are very obviously aware that the camera is there and in which the presence of the camera changes their behavior? And yeah, in the interview clip that's on eCampus, um, Wiseman says that his biggest influence was Groucho, Harpco, and Chico, who are the Marx brothers, um, no relation to Carl, um, who were kind of uh, American comedians, um, vaudeville comedians, which means lots of physical comedy, even though Groucho Marx also was extremely witty. Um, and used to kind of fire these one-liners off and almost kind of, yeah, like a machine gun of jokes. Um, and these films are kind of anarchic, surreal, also extremely technically precise. And their most famous film, probably the most famous film, and definitely probably their most loved film, or the film which kind of epitomizes their achievements as filmmakers, is Duck Soup which I've uploaded a clip from uh, to eCampus, or I've put it on eCampus, a clip from Duck Soup. And Wiseman in this interview uh, says that he thinks, the interviewer asks him, well, why did you make documentaries and not make Duck Soup? 
Um, why didn't you make films like the Marx Brothers? And Wiseman responds by saying, well, you know, in some ways, I think I did make Duck Soup. I think I do make Duck Soup every time I'm making a movie. And what I want to ask you guys is, is that true? Do you see kind of aspects of the Marx Brothers, um, this kind of anarchic comedy, which feels like it's about to kind of just fall out of the frame and has is simultaneously kind of grandiose and subversive and surreal and serious. Um, do you see any of that in Wiseman? Do you think he's telling the truth? Um, and can you see what he means? Um, that's an honest question. And final question is, is there an argument or an ethical or political position that is put forward in welfare? Um, if so, what is it? And how can you identify it in the film? Um, none of those are trick questions, um, but they're all quite open questions. So you should answer them um, with your own opinion and your own feeling. Um, if the answer to all of them is no, then that's fine. Um, so yeah, again, uh, we'll talk about those in the next catch-up session. If you want to send them to me, you can do. If you don't want to send them to me, you don't have to. Um, and yeah, I hope you liked Welfare. Um, I hope you watched it all because it really is worth watching. Um, it's by far the longest film we're looking at, so I'm not going to throw anything like this at you again. And next week we're watching When Harry Met Sally, so it will be a different, it will be a change of tone again. And yeah, okay guys, take care, email me if you have any questions, and I hope that you're enjoying as much of the sun as is safe and possible. So, ciao, bye.